on June 23, 2023, the world was captivated by the news coming from Russia. Yevgeny Prigozhin, the owner of the Wagner Group private military company, had launched a march on Moscow with a declared goal of removing Russia's top military figures, Sergei Shoigu and Valery Gerasimov, from office. During the advance on Moscow, Wagner shot down several Russian helicopters with human casualties exceeding a dozen men. Confused by what was going on, the media labelled the affair a mutiny, a rebellion, a coup d'etat, or even a civil war. Although the matter seems to have fizzled out for now, it raised the question of whether an actual civil war in Russia is possible today. In this video, we will try to answer this question by looking at Russia's informal political system, its main influence groups, and challenges that could potentially lead to a full-scale military confrontation within Russia itself. And from oligarchs you can't depend on to an accessory you can, allow us to mention the sponsor for this video, Ridge, who bring you the Ridge Ring. This is a premium ring for the modern age, built with high-end materials like carbon fiber, tungsten carbide and titanium, these rings represent simplicity and strength. The outer beveled edge and convex interior makes them nice to wear, and each ring comes with a dual band silicon ring for a comfy casual alternative. But perhaps best of all is the fact that if you lose your ring, or if you change weight and need to get it resized, Ridge will do that for you for free twice. No need to worry about investing in a premium ring when you've got a guarantee that powerful backing you up. Putin wishes his investments were so secure. And we're going to make it even better for you with a discount code. Use code KINGSANDGENERALS at ridge.com slash kingsandgenerals to get 10% off. Get a ring for life with Ridge and enjoy some modern sophistication with built-in peace of mind. Go to ridge.com slash kingsandgenerals to check them out. Russia's current political system can be best described by an election campaign slogan of the United Russia Party. Strong president, strong country. Vladimir Putin is a true autocrat who stands above all branches of government and holds a monopoly on key decision making. Russia's formal political system is largely decorative in nature. United Russia, the country's largest political party, holds over 72% of the seats in the state Duma, the lower house of the Russian parliament. United Russia's leadership includes all major national figures, thus securing the loyalty of the party, as well as the obedience of the Duma. The upper house of the parliament, the Federation Council, is formed by the representatives of Russia's regions, yet the lower house can dissolve it. At last, there is the Security Council, a consultative body which is formed by Putin and aims to discuss key strategic national policies. This entire formal government structure includes over 50,000 people, an absolute majority of which are replaceable. A similar picture of centralized rule can be seen in Russia's regions. Since 2001, the influence of the local elites has declined drastically through the efforts of the Kremlin. Changes in the Russian tax system resulted in most regions becoming dependent on the federal center financially, thus leaving little room for disobedience. In addition, the Kremlin has introduced a simple scheme to assign governors to the regions. There, the head of the federal subject would resign from his office about seven months before the local elections and be replaced by an interim appointee from Moscow who would then quote-unquote win the elections. Those appointees were labelled parachutists, who have little to no connection to the region they govern, have made their careers elsewhere, and are loyal to the Kremlin rather than their assigned federal subject. As of summer 2023, an overwhelming majority of Russian governors are parachutists. Because of this system of strict vertical subordination, it would be safe to say that the so-called Russian Federation is a federation in name only. It would also mean that the hopes of those opposed to the Kremlin that Russia would eventually get overwhelmed by a wave of separatism are largely misplaced. As of July 2023, in only 10 regions of Russia, the local elites are in charge of their region and would potentially have the means to move against the federal government. The overall phoniness of Russia's formal political system, however, doesn't mean that Russia has no politics. Putin might be an autocrat, but running a country alone, especially one as large as Russia, is simply impossible. 
Inevitably, the autocrat has to delegate tasks and responsibilities, and allocate resources to his subordinates, thus diluting some of his power in favour of maintaining overall control. Those subordinates form their own patronage groups, which in turn compete against each other for a more favourable place in the system. Putin accepts and encourages such competition, as too much cooperation between the groups could pose a danger to the autocrat himself. The groups, in turn, accept the role of Putin as an arbitrator in the intra-elite conflicts. In a series of analytical reports and presentations, Minchenko Consulting proposes a system describing the state of the top Russian elites called Politburo 2.0. This small group of men are Putin's closest and most trusted subordinates. They can get unscheduled personal audiences with the autocrat, set meeting agendas, and accumulate a sizable pool of resources, be it financial, political, media, or brute force. As of May 2023, Politburo 2.0 is thought to include 11 men, with Mikhail Mishustin and Sergei Kiryenko being the most recent additions to the group. The Ukrainian Institute for the Future proposed another scheme describing the Russian elites. In a report from March 2023, the authors highlight six groups of influence in the Kremlin, each of which has sufficient resources to exert political influence and contest for power. Several of the groups are heterogeneous and have their own internal divisions, disputes and conflicts. Yet on the strategic level, they tend to defend their common interests. Perhaps the most infamous of the groups is that of the Siloviki, a Russian term which can be roughly translated as strongmen or enforcers. This group is also the most heterogeneous, including various organizations related to the army, state security, and law enforcement. Those include the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the FSB, the Foreign Intelligence Service, and Roskvadia, to name a few. An undisputed leader of this group is Nikolai Petrushev, an extremely conservative, hawkish, and anti-Western figure known to be a conspiracy theorist. A less well-known yet still very important figure in this group is the Kremlin Chief of Staff, Anton Vaino, whose main role is presumed to be that of communication with other political groups. The Minister of Defense, Sergei Shoigu, undoubtedly belongs to the Siloviki too, as well as the head of the FSB, Alexander Borchnikov. However, their influence on the decision-making process in Russia is presumed to be weaker. Of particular interest is the head of the Roskvadia, Viktor Zolotov, as the man who runs Russia's internal military force, he might be the person to play kingmaker in case Russia finds itself in a political crisis. Although the Siloviki seem to be powerful, they don't have that much to offer besides brute force. Besides the military budget, they have some financial sources of their own, but not their own bank. They control the Roscosmos Corporation, yet their general influence on the economy is exaggerated. The Siloviki have control over 19 regions, notably most of North Caucasus. However, they have very little influence over Russia's formal political system. The greatest weakness of this group is a lack of media. It is unsurprising then that in the long conflict between Shoigu and Prigozhin, the former more often than the latter became an object of public ridicule. An often overlooked influence group in Russia is the one of Sergei Chemizov, roughly corresponding to the military-industrial complex. In a state as belligerent as Russia, the person responsible for the arms industry inevitably exerts a great deal of political influence. Most other groups need Chemizov, yet the military-industrial complex has a function too specific for this group to be sizable. Chemizov is the CEO of Rostec, which owns Novicom Bank, thus making it possible to keep financial flows within the group. In Parliament, the MIC has control over the committees relevant to its operations, as well as over the Federal Agency for Mineral Resources. Chemizov exerts control over just four regions, although ones that are rich in natural resources. However, the MIC has no muscle of its own, as the state already guards its enterprises. Just as in the case of the Siloviki, the military-industrial complex has little to offer when it comes to media. Perhaps the group most important for the Russian economy is that of gas industry interests. It is comprised of Russia's two largest natural gas producers, Gazprom and Novatek, as well as several billionaires with businesses related to the gas industry. 
The most important figures of the group include the CEO of Gazprom, Alexei Miller, a gas pipeline supplier, Arkady Rottenberg, an energy market investor, Gennady Timchenko, and last but probably not least, Dmitry Medvedev, the former chairman of Gazprom. This group is more than just a gas extraction business. Gazprom, Russia's largest company, is almost a state within a state. It has its own military force, Gazprom's security service. There are representatives of the group in the Russian government as well as parliament. Combined, Gazprom and Novotec exert control over nine Russian regions, key for the gas industry. Surprisingly, for an outside viewer, Gazprom owns one of Russia's most important media holdings. This group controls several TV channels, production studios, radio stations, newspapers and web hosting services, with its content ranging from crime dramas to stand-up shows to football match broadcasts to business analytics. Combined with the largest source of revenue available in Russia, the Gas Industry Interests Group is one of the most influential of them all, with an array of resources wide enough to potentially even threaten Putin himself. Gas, however, is not the only energy resource Russia exports. Similarly, there is a group formed around oil industry interests. Of particular importance here is the Rosneft company and its CEO, Igor Sechin. Just like Gazprom, Rosneft has its own security service and a substantial source of revenue. However, in other aspects, Rosneft has been on a steady decline. This group never had a sizable media empire to begin with, while its influence with the Russian parliament, as well as Russian regions, has decreased significantly in the past 10 years. However, Rosneft has found itself a different niche, that of communication with Western politicians and businessmen. It is thus unsurprising that one of the Rosneft chairmen is the infamous Gerhard Schroeder. The most unusual of the groups of influence in the Kremlin is the Kovalchuk group. Rather than forming a clan around an industry or a sphere of activity, the two Kovalchuk brothers, Yuri and Mikhail, have built their network of support on personal friendship with Vladimir Putin. Shortly after coming to power, Putin elevated a mediocre regional Russia bank owned by Yuri Kovalchuk to one of the key Russian financial institutions. Although lacking its own military force, this group has sponsored the emergence of multiple Russian private military companies, including Wagner, and has promoted its protégés into governmental positions, notably the Natural Resources Committee, the Ministry of Energy, and the Ministry of Industry and Trade. Prime Minister Mikhail Mishushtin is thought to be, at least to some extent, a Kovalchuk figure. With the National Media Group, as well as the VGTRK Broadcasting Company, the Kovalchuks have a significant media presence, mostly targeting an old, conservative audience that prefers TV as the main source of information. Their control over regions, however, is modest, and is comprised of only five border regions. The youngest of the groups, and already one of the most important ones, is the technocrats. They tend to support economic liberalization, raising the efficiency of the state apparatus, and are generally considered to have a more modern outlook. It would be wrong, however, to consider them liberal paragons of freedom and democracy. The most prominent of the technocrats are Sergei Kirienko and Hermann Greff. The key asset of this group is an established system of raising and cultivating professional cadres for the Russian elite. Multiple programs, such as Russia, the Land of Opportunities, Leaders of Russia, and School of Governors, have already produced a huge number of rather competent administrators. In the foreseeable future, it could be the main driver for the refreshment of Russian elites. The technocrats also have access to other resources. Hermann Greff is the chairman and CEO of Sparebank, the largest bank in Russia. The graduates of the technocrats have a significant presence in parliament, as well as strikingly large control over Russian regions, 26 in total. Most impressively, the technocrats have a de facto monopoly on the internet sphere. Sverbank is the owner of Rambler, while the son of Sergei Kirienko heads the VK Group, which has control over all of the Russian social networks, as well as the information services of Yandex. Alongside the elite groups, there are also trustees, people who have their own assigned functions and respond directly to Putin rather than to any of the groups. Typical trustees include Yuri Trutnev, responsible for the Far East, Deputy Chief of Staff Dmitry Kozak, 
and a designated liberal, Alexei Necheyev, leader of the New People Party. Arguably the most influential of the trustees is the mayor of Moscow, Sergei Sobyanin. He is included in Politburo 2.0, and his functions, besides being the head of Russia's capital city, also include patronage over local elites in general. The infamous Ramzan Kadyrov, an undeclared Sultan of Chechnya, is a trustee as well. He controls a region with a recent history of insurgency, and is also an informal communicator with the elites of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Interestingly enough, multiple military formations, collectively known as the Kadyrovites, are technically part of the Rosgvardia, and Kadyrov himself is a figure somewhat aligned with Viktor Zolotov. Yevgeny Prigozhin is also a trustee, or at least he used to be one. However, his role in the system and his ambitions to improve it deserve a video of their own. Now that we know more about the way Russia is governed, we can think about how this informal political system can be put down. The elites face multiple challenges, such as military defeats on the battlefields of Ukraine, an increasingly costly confrontation with the West, or a decrease in revenue from gas and oil exports. The Kremlin is threatened by two groups of citizens, who have the potential for protest sentiments. One is that of the Western-aligned younger generation, residents of large cities, and generally people who consider themselves liberals. The other is comprised of extremist, revanchist, and chauvinist radicals, who consider Putin to be too soft, inefficient, and ultimately undeserving to be the Russian autocrat. With the right amount of propaganda, repression, concessions and cosmetic changes to the formal political system, both groups can ultimately be managed, but in the case of a major crisis, they can pose a significant danger to the status quo. The system's most significant weakness, however, is Vladimir Putin himself. In this political configuration, he doesn't and can't safely have an undisputed heir. Once Putin's political career ends, one way or another, the system will lose its key element and would have to react. None of the groups would have a decisive advantage, and it is likely to see them organized into coalitions with one another, as well as some of the trustees. In a scenario optimistic for the Kremlin, the political groups would find an agreement and appoint a new Russian autocrat, thus preserving the system as a whole. If a working solution isn't found, however, the groups would have to mobilize resources from the regions they control, by that time, the level of escalation in the struggle between the groups might be quite high, and it is not outside the realm of possibility to see a civil war being waged between the elite groups. In such circumstances, the role of the local elites would rise, and the ideas of separatism would get more relevant every day. This is a sort of scenario that would lead to an outcome desired by many of the Kremlin's enemies, that of Russia's dismemberment and cessation as a unified entity. More videos on this topic are on the way, so make sure to subscribe and press the bell button to see them. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing, it helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.